I think um, I'm going to try and sort of pull together some responses to what a lot of people have said today. And I think that if we've learned anything from all of these talks today, it is that DJ culture is appalling. <laughs> it's hideous. It's a terrible thing. The people that we've met today are the good people. You know, these are wonderful, innovative, exciting people who can spot the right places to go and the right ideas to catch a hold of and the right waves to surf. And they are the exceptions to the rule. The guy you just saw in the video talked about the hedonistic imperative. And we know what the hedonistic imperative leads to. It leads to lying in the gutter, wondering where your mates have gone. It leads to being messed up. DJ culture is a horrible thing. It's a set of people just being cogs in wheels, playing another beat of another track, of another DJ set, of another club night, of another festival, of another cultural wave. And it goes on and on and on. And every single track that the DJ plays is just an illusion of innovation, it's just novelty. All it is, is as a very innovative electronic musician friend of mine once said, when I asked him where his music fit into the particular waves and sub-genres sub of music, um, he said, it's just the same music that people who'd eaten some meat that had gone off in the caveman days and started feeling a bit funny and heard their mate playing the drum and went, well... <laughs> That's what music he makes. And this is a guy at the cutting edge of technology. It's the same thing. It's just filling that gap in our lives. We're animals. We're animals with certain needs for sex, food, reproduction, and, and for going, donk, 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 donk. Yeah, this one's wicked, brilliant, yeah. You know, where have we come since the beginning of the DJ? Nowhere. <laughs> DJ culture is embarrassment, it's tiredness, it's thinking, oh, yeah. And, and with those flashes of brilliance, the flashes of bright light, the flashes of the rush of the drugs and of like, oh, my God, this is the place, this is it. And then actually 99% of your night is spent going, where's the guy with the coke? How long have I got to stay talking to you until someone who might have sex with me comes along? <laughs> When's Carl Cox on? <laughs> that is DJ culture. That is where we're all at. Every DJ is bitching about the other DJs, but also trying to ask lick up to them so that they might have a collaboration someday. You know, it's, it's a machine. It's a machine that just keeps grinding on night after night after night after night after night. And you're all part of it. And you're all responsible for the deaths of millions of people in Colombia and Mexico and Jamaica and everywhere else that the syndicates funded by your drug use and your alcohol use and your use of these venues pays for. It's a hideous machine. It's a hideous death machine. And we keep coming back. And when I was, I guess, 18, when I was 16, 15 maybe, I was 15 in 1989, and Acid House was exploding around the place, and I heard this electronic music, and it was amazing, and it reminded me of the, the science fiction soundtracks I'd grown up on, and the Doctor Who music, and all this kind of thing. And I would lie awake at night, having smoked my first joint, listening to John Peel, and he would play these Acid House tracks. I was just like, this is incredible. This has never happened before. And... and when I was 18, I moved to Brighton and I fell down the rabbit hole. And out every night, on it, feeling it, having it, totally. And I had all these realisations. I was at university and studying Jacques Derrida and, and Roland Barthes, who's been mentioned already tonight, and all of these ideas that... Uh, that knowledge and understanding could be seized back from the people who are in control of it, that the, the old colonial powers or the, the, the white men in Westminster or whoever they are who tell you what the meaning of things are, is 
don't matter. You decide. You can look at it from a different angle. You could deconstruct. Jack Demeter talked about deconstruction. You could actually pull things apart and see how they worked. You know, it was full of academic jargon, but at the bottom of it, this is what it was. You could pull it apart. You could see how it worked. And no one else, the death of the author, this is, you know, we, we heard about this. No one else could tell you how to see it. You pulled it apart and you saw it from your own angles. And it was all right, you know, this theory stuff, but I saw it coming from these tutors at university who were full of their own shit and full of their own hierarchies, and they were trying to impose their own ideas. I, mean, I was just like, this is shit. And then I would meet the people that I met going out, and they were living it and embodying it and embodying the fact that you could re constitute your own ideas every single moment of every day. The babble that you would hear at a party, just at an after party, just talking to some random ex-biker who'd become a transsexual crusty and was into like the number 23 and crystals and all this sort of shit. But the babble and the, the, the dissolution of words and the fact that all of their subconscious and their life stories were coming flowing out at you and yours were flowing back at them and, and all of the rearrangement of music and stuff, you know, this was chaotic. I've talked about this before. There's, if, if you want to Google, you know, mm, you can go online and, sorry, I'm going to have to have some water. <laughs> so, mate, yeah, you've got, you got a bit of water. Mm. I've got, got some Rizzlers, yeah. Mm. Mm. you got... And yeah, hang on, I've got a clipper on a string round my neck. Um, <laughs> I've, I've talked online before, there's a, there's a little video talk I did about this kind of realisation that I had at that time, that there was something actually new going on, which was that the artwork was no longer the record, it was no longer the performance, it was no longer the person with a guitar on stage, singing a song to you, the audience, you know, with this sort of one-way broadcast relationship. It wasn't even what was coming out of the sound system. It was your reaction to what was coming out of the sound system and the person next to you's reaction to your reaction to what was coming out of the sound system and the person next to them's reaction to... Her. And it just expanded outwards and outwards and outwards. And the artwork was the night itself. It was the entirety of every conversation, every reaction to music, every thought, every nerve signal, every single thing that was going on through that night and spilling out of the club to the after parties and out into people's lives and into the way that they thought. And no one was in control of it. There was no artist anymore. There was no one person who defined this. But in the middle of it was the DJ, the conductor of chaos. And there were good DJs and there were bad DJs. And there were DJs who just kept things ticking along while the rest of the, the artwork, the chaos, the, the beauty and everything went around them. And there were great ones who could shift everything. Just a tiny shift. And I'm not talking about, um, you know, here comes the rush, here comes the rush, and we're all feeling it. It would be like playing disco records, playing disco records, and then playing that disco record. Okay, and everything's a bit lighter, or you have a different conversation with the person next to you. And, you know, I started to learn that the best clubs were not the hippie club or the black people's club or the gay people's club or whichever one it was, the jungle club, the trance club which you might go to all of. This was still like, you know, when I started doing all this, this was 1992. This was the point where the fragmentation was happening from the original kind of rave explosion. But on any given night, you would end up going to three clubs and a party on the beach or something. And, you know, you would, you would mix with all these people and you realise very, very quickly that the best clubs were the ones with the biggest range of people in them. You know, they were the parties, they were the special ones that, you know, you, you had to kind of get to know people to get to. Um, and not the, you know, special knowledge ones, but the ones where you actually like felt, as the Italians say, simpatico. You actually kind of thought, here's a great conversation, let's carry this on, let's share a cab. And, you know, you end up in a great place. And at the centre of this, bringing different people together. And this sounds, you know, such a stupid 1992 raver's dream to bring people together. But it happened on the good nights, at the good places, and part of that was the DJ. And the DJ was not just going, I'm building up to this, I'm building up to this, here's my signature tune, let's all have a rush, hey! They were 
bringing together. And the, the music was changing over time, and you know, jungle was accelerating, and trance was getting trippier, and all of these different things were coming in. And the DJs were responsible for mixing the ideas and mixing the people. Now, I screwed up, we all screwed up. That ecstatic dream ended up in the gutter. I mean, you know, it does for most people. Most people don't end up having in true enlightenment or becoming a great DJ or doing anything great. You know, it took me <sighs> so many broken relationships, so many broken bones, so many nights falling over before I even was able to earn a basic living and not have to work in a restaurant kitchen. You know, these... these, these it, it was, there was no great revel revelation out of all this. And there hasn't been, for society, there hasn't been any great revelation. And I think what, what Tony said is very true, that we've only had big sound for 50 years. We've had DJ culture. If you count, say, 1970, when The Loft with David Mancuso began, when the real idea of bringing unusual people together with a DJ at the center of it, shifting the mood and, and the lights and the, you know, this particular environment, this particular laboratory for pushing people together. Um, that's, what, 40 years? 40 years, roughly, since 1970. This is nothing on the scale of, of shifting culture of the centuries of, of of uh, 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 the, the families who take power and lose power and, and all the rest of it, you know, on the epic scale of, of human uh, life. But there was something there. There was a glimmer of the idea that this person standing behind two decks, and it doesn't matter what the technology is, they enable more sophistication or finesse or whatever, but the point was creating a narrative through the sound and culture that we all understood uh, that developed over time and which uh, catalyzed social interaction, not just dancing, not just pumping your fist in the air. But the movement of a crowd and the amalgamation and splitting apart of a crowd and the, the, the discussions within the crowd and the sexual relations between different people in the crowd, that idea was new. And that idea is still new, and that idea has not been explored yet. And that's what we're here to talk about. Because when a DJ plays two records together, if a DJ plays Buju Banton, and Sylvester, together, they are saying something. They are saying something very fucking powerful. And they are saying something very fucking powerful to a crowd. And if they do that in a dance hall club, or they do it in a gay club, they are doing something very powerful that people will react to in a very physical, an emotional and real way that will make those people come away from, even if there is no violence or, or confrontation at that point, those people will come away from that night thinking, what the fuck did that signify? What did that musical clash mean? And we know that we live in a time when there are certain things that you can't discuss. You can't discuss Israel, you can't discuss taxes. These things just go in the same old loops. People say the same old things and take the same old positions. And all the time people are dying or starving or rotting away or health services are crumbling as a result. So the ability to combine ideas in new ways to put ideas across each other, to create a collage, a bricolage, as the um, Dadaists, I can't, one of them, used to say, is utterly, utterly essential. Now it becomes more essential the closer we come to self-destruction, which could be today, it could be in a thousand years, we don't know. But the ability to put ideas across each other in a way that people have never heard and to bring the people who have those ideas together face to face and go, what happens when we put your ideas together? This is what DJs can do. This is why we need to understand what DJs do and why they do what they do. Um, Herman Hess, the, 
the German um, proto-hippie, I guess you'd call him, um, wrote a book called The Glass Bead Game, and it had a fascinating concept at its heart, which was, it was kind of science fiction. It was set in a future where the world was run by these monastic orders who have created this thing called the glass bead game, and it's like an infinitely more complex version of chess, where each piece, these glass beads on wires that are moved in these complicated and, and, and very involved ways, represents ideas, represents themes, and these guys in these monasteries were able to have discussions with one another of very abstract things, of political and aesthetic and, and uh, a, a, a serious consequence to reality by playing this game. And this is a, a fascinating idea. It's like, you know, it pre-configured computers. It pre-configured the abstractions of computers through which people could, like, process international relations by data mining and stuff. But it was also very, very poncy. It was... Uh, Hermann Hesse was a bit of a, 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 a floaty Buddhist, and he didn't really know what to do with this idea, and, um, you know, the book goes nowhere, really. But the concept of people using these abstractions to process ideas is real. If DJ, I mean, we, we have, we have currently online, we have things like That's My Jam, we have, um, I can't remember, there's a new one that everyone was jumping on today where you create your own DJ sets from YouTube things, and it's interactive. People kind of battle with each other with their DJ sets. You're processing streams of ideas, streams. Every single song you play says thousands of different things, and the streams of them contain contain gigabytes of information about culture, about affiliation, about sexuality, about all of these things. And by playing your playlists up against your friends, you are negotiating, you're telling each other things about each other. This is what DJs can do, and I haven't really got anything else to say, so thank you.